Okay, I think it's 9.30. Let's, um, let's start. Uh, so we had been uh, discussing the um, concepts of um, pyral stress hmm? um, last week. So you remember what pyral stress is, is that you assume that an entire dislocation jumps from one Pyrals Valley to the next Pyrals Valley in one go, this big jump. And um, at room temperature, excuse me, I know the room temperature, at uh, absolute uh, zero, you can ca actually calculate what, um, uh, what it takes, yes? And we've seen that it's very different whether you have screw or edge dislocations and whether you look at alpha iron or gamma iron. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know from uh, this that um, screw dislocations require very high pyral stresses. Mm -hmm. Okay, now turns out that uh, room temperature, uh, we will measure things like uh, the critical resolved shear stress. And we'll see in a moment that uh, this idea of the, 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 the screw dislocation jumping from one Pyrrhus Valley into the other ones as, as a whole um, doesn't uh, really hold. Uh, but with steel, it's, as I said, complex. Uh, anyway, so, so first let's look at what we measure experimentally. If you uh, take a single crystal, you orient it um, in, a, in a way that you make sure there's only one slip, slip system that works. Um, for instance, in this case, one Burgess vector and one 110 plane, yes, <coughs> you find uh, a what you actually find when you, when you actually measure it, you measure a, um, a tensile strength in compression, yeah? uh, not a tensile, a yield strength in compression that is equal to 38 megapascal. And then you have to recalculate this to know what the critical uh, shear stress is. You do this with the Schmidt factor and you find 19 megapascal is the uh, shear uh, stress, critical shear stress. It's kind of low value, yes? Um, now, let's have a look at um, so what, what happens beyond the yield point, yes? I have a few new slides here. I just l uploaded them this morning. Um, so you, well, maybe not this one, but um, uh, a few that I will be discussing in a moment. Um, so make sure you, you check the, uh, the, new, um, the, the new file um, on the E-class. So, um, right, so, so this is another other measurement, but it, it's a it's, uh, similar type of measurements. You see that material y starts to yield at, you know, between 10 and 20 megapascal, 20 um, uh, uh, megapascal being um, a good value. And then we see that uh, the material, the, the sing single crystal hardens, and we'll be discussing that when we discuss strain hardening. Uh, that is due to dislocation, dislocation interaction. But if we look at the, uh, the temperature dependence of this critical shear stress, um, so at around room temperature, we around 20 uh, megapascal. And then as we decrease the temperature, you can see a very strong increase. Yes? Uh, and it, you know, the measurements don't go as low as 0K, but you can, you can see from the data, if you would uh, extend the, the straight line there, that, um, you know, you wouldn't be far from the 400 uh, megapascal. So the idea um, that um, so is that correct that the dislocation actually jumps at low temperature from one pyrus valley to the other one? 
Well, as I said, for, for alpha iron, for, for ferritic steels, etc., it's a little bit more complex. That's not what's happening. What's, the reason why it increases so strongly is due to the, the fact that the core of the dislocation is spread out. Yes, is spread out. Right? And, and that kind of keeps, uh, gives, it gives me very high critical shear stresses um, uh, of the dislocations. Okay? Right. And, and so we discussed um, the slip systems and, and how uh, uh, alpha R is really special because not only do you have a, a spread out core you, uh, and as a consequence you have uh, so-called non-Schmidt behavior, non-Schmidt behavior that in that the normal stresses on the slip plane are important, not only the shear stresses. And you have other effects, of course, very strong thermal uh, temperature dependence. Uh, and then you have, it depends on what direction the Burgers factor is oriented. You know, if, if you go in, the, in the, the twinning direction on, and you have slip on one, one, two types planes, it, you'll have a slightly different stress as in the anti-twinning direction. And then there are, there are uh, uh, complications um, with the slip plane. And it turns out that in pure alpha iron, slip plane is 110, only at very low temperatures. But that in steels, this low temperature, uh, because of de-alloying, this low temperature slip system actually prevails also at high temperatures. So in the case of steels, we're probably looking at always 110 slip, yes. Uh, but that's been much less, surprisingly, much less studied. Um, uh, so very few people have done uh, good work on binary uh, uh, alloys of iron and look at the slip systems there. And actually, some of this work that I show here has only been done very recently. Uh, and the reason is because it's very hard to make high purity iron you know, without having any uh, bit of uh, in particular carbon or any other. Um, and this, again, you know, looks surprising considering that we can make um, uh, silicon uh, and, and semiconductor crystals with extremely high purity that it's actually extremely, uh, it's even extremely difficult to find an equivalent uh, single crystal for iron or any other metal for that matter. Hmm? Um, but that's a fact of life. Okay, and uh, so, so the data here, uh, you know, if for those who um, look carefully at, at the data I show, you'll see that, uh, you know, the critical sh shear stress is not always the same. It's uh, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20, and, uh, and there seem to be a lot of scatter, and that's true, yes? So um, your question may be, so you know, if, I do, if I'm doing calculation, what value should I use? Well, you know, a good value is 20, yes? And, that's a, um, uh, and that would be the value uh, I would be using if I were to do calculations. You know, there's no reason to use anything anything else and uh, the way you, de you actually determine the, the critical stress in practice uh, is also a, uh, a challenge. Uh, and then you'll say, well, why is it a challenge? Well, it seems like a, such a simple experiment to do. The trouble is not only is it difficult to, uh, to make single crystals of metals uh, of extremely high purity, like you would do for, uh, for uh, semiconductors, but it's also very, very hard to make uh, single crystals of iron or uh, of metals uh, that do not contain any dislocations. Um, the level of uh, purity and, um, uh, that is achieved in the semiconductor industry, yes, like for silicon or any other uh, semiconductor, is extremely high. And there, the defect level in these crystals is incredibly low. Right? It's extremely, it's almost impossible with the current state of technology uh, because there's no application for single crystals of iron um, uh, that, um, you know, to achieve extremely low levels of uh, dislocation. So as a consequence, you get microplasticity. So when you start to 
uh, stress a single crystal, you're sure it's not, there, is, there are not zero percent of dislocations in there. So um, dislocations are already present there. We can give you what we say microplastic effects. You know, they'll start moving uh, quickly. Uh, and, and so that it looks like it yields very early. So if you, uh, in practice, if I may go back, when you measure the, when you actually measure the, the critical shear stress, you, you don't measure here. You, you look at this first stage of hardening and you extend it to zero strain. That, that would be a way to do it. Okay, so that's why I'm saying, um, you know, 20, megapascal is a good critical result shear stress for pure iron. Now, um, right, so, um, and of course you'll say, uh, well, okay, so we've gone this far and we know that 20 megapascal is the critical result shear stress for alpha iron, so that we're happy with that, but we don't work with alpha iron, A and, 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 uh, and B, we work with, with steel and they're polycrystalline. So, how, you know, what do I do? with that value of 20 or 19, as I uh, a few slides back uh, said. Um, you know, when, that, when will a pure iron polycrystal start to yield, yes? And there, um, uh, and, and, and that's a big challenge. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know how do you uh, c connect what you measure to in the single crystal with the polycrystal? Hmm? Uh, and it's one of the, you know, the, the people spending their whole research on this, you know, is uh, polycrystalline plasticity. Hmm? And, and the reason is because you have different oriented single crystals, yes, and, uh, and um, they will have different uh, behavior, of course, because, you know, the slip systems will be different. And so we need some kind of averaging procedure, yes? Okay? And um, so you can have averaging procedures that, for instance, assume that uh, there is isotropy. You know, all parts of the crystal, of the polycrystal are the same. Um, that we have a very large number of grains, so we can really average. Hmm? And that there is no preferred orientation, and that there are no grain, grain size effects. Hmm? Yeah? Okay. So uh, these are actually quite a lot of uh, strong um, uh, conditions. Hmm? And, and they usually you know, will not apply for steels. You know, if you take sheet steel, for instance, we, uh, we already discussed this, you have pronounced um, uh, crystallographic orientation. And, and so uh, this, this may not uh, hold. Having said this, um, there is an additional complication. Is the, how are you going to do the averaging procedure? Yes? And that, there, uh, and you may already, some of you may already be familiar with that, it's, there's always this problem of, um, if you have your single crystal results, yeah, which are basically shear stresses and shear and shears, yes? On a single slip system. Uh, there are two ways to, to do the averaging, and two extreme ways. And this, you, you can say, well, I have equal stress conditions, yes? Or you can say, I have equal strain conditions. And um, nobody can really say, you know, who's right, who's wrong. Uh, uh, however, we, we know that uh, equal strain calculations give give results that are very close to reality. So that's, uh, and that's not the case with equal stress conditions, okay? <coughs> and, and this is kind of a cartoon of what equal stress conditions mean. It's as if the grains would all be uh, in a row, then you get equal stress conditions, and you can have uh, different strains. And if you have equal strain conditions, you, your grains are kind of all parallel to each other and parallel to the, 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 the stress axis, the applied stress axis, okay? And what we'll see is that if we have equal 
stress condition, we can calculate the stress from the single crystal data by dividing by uh, the, Sch the Schmidt factor, a mean Schmidt factor, yes? If we use equal strain conditions, we can calculate the stress strain conditions hmm, in, in, in tensile stress, tensile compression, uh, using our single crystal data and multiply, uh, using our single crystal uh, uh, tau value and multiplying with what we call the Taylor factor, the Taylor factor. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so if you consider the tensile stress as our constant, yes, uh, for all the grains, yeah. Uh, then you'll have yielding, and you don't worry about the, the strains. The strains are totally independent, yes? The, the grains do, can do whatever they want, yes, in that model, yeah? Uh, so the yielding will then occur when the resolved shear stress of the slip systems uh, are, are, are reached, reach a critical value, critical resolved shear stress. Hmm? Hmm? And then each grain will yield when you reach the critical uh, result shear stress of that, orient, of that particular orientation, right? So what you basically do is, well, you just randomize, you just calculate what would be, if I had all possible orientation, what would be the M value? What would be the, the random uh, M value? Hmm? And so it's, 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 it's uh, relatively simple. Sigma is tau uh, critical resolved shear stress in this case divided by this mean M value, which is 2.08 for alpha iron. Somebody, somebody went out there and just you know, went through uh, all possible orientation and calculated the mean value. So, so what does this mean, for instance? You want uh, you want to know the yield strength of uh, if you have 19 megapascal, yes, and you find 39, about 40 megapascal. Okay, um, it's a little bit different. Just last week I calculated the same value, but that the, t the value two, yes, that was for a one, for a specific orientation, yes. In this case, it's the mean value. Hmm? Okay. I'm using the mean value. And in gamma iron, gets slightly different value is 2.238. Okay? Good. Um, good, so that's a valid way of calculating aver uh, averaging procedure. Another uh, way is the, the Taylor approach. And there you have the same strain, okay? Same strain. And uh, right, and, and so you get different uh, uh, be because of the stresses. You have this deformation that you so you have to ac um, accommodate uh, the possibility of multiple slip, and not a single slip in each grain, because hmm? the, the grains are oriented a different way. Yes. They have, you, you say, you have to strain the same way, yes? You don't, you don't say the stresses are the same every, you have to deform the same way, yeah? And you have to deform the way the whole crystal, the, the whole uh, steel deforms, right? So, so, so you cannot, you understand that if, if you have a single slip system yeah, in each grain, like you have in the case of, um, so you, oops, let me just illustrate what I mean here. So you have two grains here, right? Yeah. And in the, so in, in the, uh, the first uh, approach where you say, uh, you know, stresses are the same, yes? Um, then, and, uh, well, say you have this slip system here, yes? And you have this slip system here, yes? If this guy goes like this, and this guy goes like this, there will be holes in your crystal. There will be ho you're going to start making holes. Yes. Okay. So that's not the case in um, with Taylor, with t Taylor system. 
because the strains have to be, um, the deformation has to be, uh, you know, does, has, has to be the, the same deformation in the grains, in every grain, you have to take more than one slip system. Okay, so that's, that's a first complication. And, and so, of course, you, uh, and the reason is because each grain is limited by the presence of the neighboring grains during deformation. And, and so you need to uh, you know, take more slip systems into the equation. Hmm? So say you have a macroscopic shear yeah, uh, of your polycrystal is given by the incremental slip contributed by the individual active slip system. So the, the, uh, the, uh, so you have more than one slip system in the grain and the contribution yes, is the sum of the contributions from the individual slip systems. Yeah? So, say, so just to make things a little bit, it's, it's complex, okay? So, so I'm, I'm kind of squashing things all um, on one slide here. So but say we're interested in uniaxial tests. Yeah? and we have a randomly oriented alpha iron polycrystal. So, so we apply a stress in the x-axis, sigma xx, and there is an you know, stress and we, there is a small increment in, uh, in strain, dxx. And so that's achieved by slip system, many different slip systems in each grain. Yeah? Okay? And the way the, the, the theory approached this is you look at the work that you do. You calculate the work that's being done with this deformation. So, so if I have this stress and with this strain, a small strain, this is the work, yes? This is the macroscopic work, yes? Yeah. This is also what you measure, right? The, 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 the stress and the strain, that's, those are the things that you will physically be measuring. In the crist in, in, at the crystal level, we've got all the crystals contributing a little bit to the, the strain via shear, yes? And there's more than one um, uh, slip system per grain, yeah? So, so we have the macroscopic uh, uh, work is equal to the micros mic macroscopic work, equal to the microscopic work, which is the work of each slip system. So uh, tau times d gamma i, okay? And you know, if we're looking, if we're simply looking at the uh, at the yielding, then uh, the the critical result shear stress, if we assume it to be uh, a constant, yes, tau critical resource shear stress, we see that we can make a ratio of sigma xx divided by tau uh, because they're equal, right? So I can divide sigma xx divided by tau. Uh, critical result shear stress is equal to d gamma, this, this here, yeah, divided by d epsilon xx. And this ratio, uh, that's, the, that's the Taylor factor. Okay? Okay. Right. So, again, um, this uh, Taylor factor hmm, um, is a number. Turns out that you know, you can go through all the mathematics, you know, and in the case of a uniaxial tensile test, yes, uh, it turns out to be a number. You, know? you, can, you can actually relatively, uh, uh, you, when you can calculate it and you, and you find values. Uh, of course, depending, it depends on the slip systems or slip uh, um, you, you assume. You know? For instance, in gamma iron, you only have one uh, Taylor factor, that's 3.067, because we only have 111, 110 glide. In, in alpha iron, if you can assume 110, 111 glide, but you can also have gl uh, glide planes 112, yes, you have a different uh, M value. Mm -hmm. uh, you can assume pencil glide, yes, um, and, and you can also measure it experimentally. Mm -hmm. So, but you find values that are close to three hmm, in general. Okay, so what's really important if, um, 
So for, in our case, for the cores, we're interested in uh, str uh, you know, uh, examining properties and then measuring them in a tensile t test. So we're happy with this factor. You know, we will go very far with this factor of three, yes? Uh, 3.06 or 2.9. So, but we like, as I told you, for steels, uh, we have 110111 slip. Uh, so 3.067 uh, is, is the value we will remember for, but for tensile tests. But if you start looking at other deformation modes, for instance, you, you're interested in rolling or you're interested in plane uh, plain stress situations or, or any other complex, uh, then um, you should always remember that M is a function of the, 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 the crystallographic texture, hmm? the shape change, the, hmm? uh, and, and, um, and the, ge the general ge uh, arrangement of the slip system. Hmm? Let's take, for instance, here. This is a well-known um, ODF with, uh, of um, uh, very formable steel. You can see the gamma fiber here with maxima here and here, close to 111112 uh, texture components. And um, this here yes, is the distribution of the M values yes, in ODF space for a specific uh, type of deformation, namely plane strain. That would be, for instance, the ODF you would use, the, excuse me, the, um, the M values you would use to study um, rolling. And, and, and you can see, for instance, that, that in this region here, for these orientations here, you have high M values. Yeah? And in other orientations, uh, like here, for instance, in the corners, you have very low uh, M values. So what, what does this physically mean? Yeah? And uh, uh, one of the things that's really important to remember is that high M values, mm, grains that have high M values, or grains with orientations with high M values, mean that they will deform more. Yes? So if you uh, looking uh, nowadays with EBSD, for instance, systems and other, uh, uh, you can uh, easily calculate uh, Taylor factors. Yeah? But what does it physically mean? It means physically that these grains will have more deformation. They will have higher dislocation densities. Yeah? And always also remember that M is not only a function of the crystal, the, the, the crystal orientation, yes, but the stress state. Yeah? Stress state is also important. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 we had, if this would be not plain strain, but uh, uniaxial uh, uh, strain, it would be, look different. It okay? wouldn't look like this. Um, and, um, and, and, and then the just the detail here, yes, uh, because it's a calculated um, uh, factor and because uh, you, uh, you, you assume uh, more than one slip, slip system per uh, grain, uh, you have to uh, know that in general the, uh, the uh, M value is calculated hmm, uh, for a specific orientation that you have and stressing assuming that you have five independent slip systems. Yes? And um, these five independent slip systems accommodate the strain, and they are the ones that give you uh, 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 the least work for a specific deformation. Okay? That's how you select them. So it's, it's the, 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 the Taylor approach of averaging is much more complex than the equal stress approach, yes? But that's the, uh, the one that's closer to reality. Okay, so what, what does it really mean in practice for the, for the rest of the course? Yeah? 
uh, as, as, we, as we go. Well, in, in, we'll see in certain cases in the course, we will be, uh, we'll, we'll have data that looks like this, which we calculate, for instance, and it gives shear stress, yes, uh, 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 plot sh uh, uh, shear stress as a function of um, shear, and, and you don't have a stress strain curve, you have a shear, uh, shear curve, yes? So how do I go, if I have this data, can I easily go, yes, for, again, for the uniaxial tensile test case or the uniaxial compression test, yes? Very simply, I take this, the, sh the shear stress and multiply it with M, yes? I take, uh, for every point, the uh, shear divided by M uh, to find respectively the stress and the um, uh, strength, the true stress and the true. So you can easily go from, if you have tensile tests, data from single crystal, which you, uh, or, or calculations, um, uh, shear stress, shear, you can always get stress strain curves uh, from that. And simply, this, this, the factor is 3.067. Okay. Right, so um, that was just about the averaging thing. So let's continue here uh, about... Uh, yeah, so, so... We will now say something about... Um, the dislocations and, um, and the dislocation velocity. And it's a kind of an odd way to, uh, to proceed. But you will see that in the end, it kind of makes sense. But um, um, to introduce strain rate. Hmm? So, when you make measurements, this, here's uh, some measurements. You make measurements on a single crystal of iron with uh, six atomic percent of silicon. Uh, you see, when you, if you ever go in through the literature on uh, properties, mechanical properties of, of iron, uh, you very rarely actually meet, uh, get data of, um, of pure iron. You get lots of data on iron silicon. And um, the reason is because of the transformations. And that's actually one of the big challenges when you want single crystal data for iron. Uh, usually when you make single crystal, you go to high temperatures, yes? And uh, you make your single crystal like silicon at high temperatures and you cool it down and, and you, here, we know that at 900 degrees C, it doesn't matter how good your single crystal was, when you, when you go through the allotropic transformation, your beautiful single crystal turns into, goes through a, tra a phase transformation at 900 degrees C, and you basically destroy your single crystal. Yeah? So what people have done <coughs> is they've studied a lot of um, uh, iron silicon alloys because when you add about a few percents one or two percents of silicon, you're, um, there is no phase transformation anymore. And you go from high temperature ferrite to low temperature ferrite without any phase transformation. So that's very interesting, uh, but you know, it's, it's a big limitation. And that's where the people get their, their single, lots of the single crystal work. So anyway, this, so you orient your, your single crystal here, and then you, you, you measure the uh, for instance, the critical result, shear stress as a function of the, the, the temperature. And, um, and this is what you find. Uh, so you have a low temperature uh, range, yes? Uh, uh, room temperature is around here. Then you have a like, flat plateau, and then it increases, yes? And so um, what we uh, uh, idealize this behavior yes, as follows. We say there is a thermal part and an athermal part, yes? And this thermal part is often called effective, yes? So you have an effective um, stress and a temperature independent or athermal 
part to the uh, to this to the strength hmm? or, or to the critical resolved shear strength hmm? um, right and so this a thermal part is due to long range stress fields yes of uh, dislocations dislocation tangles grain boundaries hard incoherent precipitates such as carbides and nitrides hmm? and it, it and this part has a, we usually, uh, when we make uh, uh, schematics, we, we, make, we put this horizontal. In practice, it's, 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 it has a little downward slope. That's because um, of the temperature dependence of the elastic properties, the shear stress uh, becoming softer as we go to higher temperatures. And this is what we're interested in, is this, this effective um, uh, shear stress, hmm? effective uh, strength. Hmm? And, and so we have uh, this change over from, if I just go back here, so, so this change over from a, a, a flat behavior to a very strong temperature behavior, that occurs uh, for our and around 77 degrees C. Right, um, and the, the core structure, yes, of the dislocations, as I've already uh, said, is, is, um, is the reason for that. And in particular, infrared steels, alpha iron, this is a very, this, this thermal part, this effective stress is very, uh, is very strong uh, temperature dependence. So in ferritic steels, the, the dislocations are uh, extended, but it's the core is extended. And the core is extended in non-glide planes. One extension is in the glide plane, and the two other extensions are not in the glide plane. Okay? And so the temperature dependence of the strength of ferritic steel is due to this, the lattice friction that results from this spreading. In the case of the austenitic steels, and referring mainly to low stacking fault energy austenitic steels. There we have also the core is also extended, but in a different way. We have uh, uh, stacking faults on the glide plane. Hmm? But I don't have extension away from the glide plane. So there we'll see that the temperature dependence part is not influenced by the, uh, the core structure or by the lattice friction, but it's mainly influenced by dislocation intersections. Oops. So if I could, so sc the schematic is like this. Mm -hmm. In ferritic steels, the, the process of a dislocation going from one Pyros Valley to the next Pyros Valley that's the process that controls the dislocation, the, the strength, and, the, and we'll see in a moment the dislocation velocity. In the case of austenitic steels, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the glide, the, the resistance to motion of the dislocation is mainly the result of dislocation interactions. And this this particular uh, way of looking at this, yes, this, what, how does this look? Well, the dislocations with which the glide dislocation interact are forest dislocations. We call them forest dislocations because it looks as if the glide dislocation have to cut through these trees. So the, the plane is a forest. These are trees, namu in Korea, and dislocation has to cut through these trees to, to, to move, yeah? Okay, so that's, that's the process that um, controls the, the motion of dislocations. Yeah? Okay, good. So we need to have some, um, we need to derive a, a fundamental, a simple fundamental equation, yes? Uh, so we can start talking about dislocation velocity. And again, 
uh, it'll look like we go on and off on a tangent to suddenly start talking about velocity of dislocation and strain rates, but, but you'll see in a moment, you know, everything comes back to stresses and strength of uh, crystals. But so, so let's look at this, uh, this, this block that originally uh, looked like this, yeah? yeah? And then I introduced one, two, three, four uh, dislocations. Say I introduced one dislocation in this case. Um, so, and I let this dislocation move through the crystal. So when it comes out, uh, this, this is, this is what it's done, right? It's, it's, it's deformed this, um, uh, shape here, this, this volume. So let's say we have a you know, small amount of, uh, material here in the, in a crystal and the size of it is dx1, dx2 in the depth and dx3 in the height. So, and, and there are dislocations in this volume. Hmm? Okay. We'll say there are n dislocations, hmm? just n. This parameter will go away in a moment. So, um, okay, so what is the dislocation density in this uh, little bit of crystal? Hmm? So the dislocation density. Now I put a little m here, yes? And the m refers to mobile. You know, some and, and I may be a little bit sloppy. Sometimes I write it, sometimes I don't write it. But in general, in, you know, in general, this, uh, not in this, but dislocations, you, always, you, know, you have dislocations which are mobile, yes, and you have mo dislocations that are not mobile. For instance, in, uh, in the previous slide, I said you had forest dislocations, and you have dislocations that cut through it. The forest dislocations, we kind of assumed in that picture that they were not mobile. The slip dislocations are mobile because those are the ones that really contribute to plastic deformation. Okay, so okay, uh, uh, dislocation density is is what is the length of the dislocations divided by the volume, right? So n times uh, and okay, they're all edge dislocations and all parallel to each other. They all have the same Burgers factor, just to make it easy. So n times the x. Uh, two is the length, yes? And the volume of this thing is, of course, dx1, dx2, dx3. So uh, that is uh, n. n can be calculated as dislocation density times dx1 times dx3, okay? What is the shear now? What's the shear here? The shear, okay? Well, in this particular, for this particular drawing, right? I had one, two, three, four, five, n, dislocations that I've let go through this little bit of crystal. So the shear here is equal to the n times b, yes? So that's this value here, n times b, divided by this, dx3, yeah? Okay, dx3, definition of the shear. Um, right, and now I substitute uh, this equation that I had for n in here and I get the shear is density of dislocation times their Burgess factor times the x1. Yeah? In other words, the, sh the shear, yes, and, and uh, now I uh, generalize this, this equation here, hmm? the shear is equal to dislocation density times b times the average displacement of the dislocations. And now I divide this by time, the time it's taken to do this, yes? So if I divide this by time, I get the change in the, uh, the shear with time is the shear rate, and the change of the dislocation position with time is their velocity. And I get this equation here. The shear rate is dislocation density, mobile dislocation density, times their Burgess factor, times their, their velocity. And this is a fundamental, a very central equation in plasticity. Hmm? 
and we'll, you, it'll pop up um, quite a few times in, uh, in the lectures. Yeah? Right, so when the dislocation, say the dislocation density is constant, yeah? Uh, of course, and, and B is usually constant also, it's Burgess vector, then the strain rate is determined by dislocation velocity. Mm -hmm. Right, so say I take a piece of steel, you put it in a uh, tensile machine and you pull it, yeah? You pull it at a certain rate, yes? The deformation rate, yes? will be a function of the dislocation um, density, of course, but will be a function of the velocity of the dislocations. And so what does the velocity of dislocation uh, uh, depend on? Well, it depends on the force I have working on the dislocation and the mobility of the dislocations. And what is that? It basically means, uh, reflects the ease with which, or the difficulty with which, dislocation segments or dislocations can uh, move around obstacles. Yes? And again, so, so what does this mean for alpha iron ferritic steels? It means the lattice friction, certainly at lower temperature, and for austenitic steels, stainless steels, it means the forest dislocations. So this location velocity will strongly be influenced by the, the, the physical nature of these obstacles. Yeah? And these ob obstacles can be anything, really. And we'll see uh, that's going to be the central idea of strengthening mechanism, yes, is to put obstacles in the way of the dislocation to reduce their basic mobility, hmm, i.e. their velocity. Hmm, hmm. Right, and so in steels, and certainly in ferritic steels, there is this uh, pronounced dependence of uh, low temperature dislocation velocity on the crystal structure. Hmm. And again, I, I, I've said that there is a fundamental difference between alpha iron and ferrite and austenitic steels. Hmm? What happens in austenitic steels is that uh, we have the, the process of moving yes, is by the double kink nucleation and sideways propagation of these kinks. Yes? That is the way the dislocations move and surmount the piles barriers. Hmm? And the interesting thing is that that process is thermally activated and that's why we have a very strong temperature dependence. At zero K, yes, we don't have any thermal activation. And at zero K, the dislocations do indeed go as a whole, they jump from one Piles Valley to the next Piles Valley, yes? Um, so at zero K, is the, uh, dislocation movement when your, your shear stress is higher than the pyral stress. Hmm? And the dislocation moves as a whole without any kink formation. Hmm? Hmm? And if the, the stress is too small, yes, there's no motion of the dislocation. Hmm? And in the veritic steels, these, the screw dislocations, because they lie ar along Piles Valley and they, can, they have a, a, a core that's extended over a number of um, glide planes, yes, uh, they will have very high uh, Piles potentials. Hmm? But if the temperature is high enough, we can form kinks, yes? yes? And, and that way, um, we get this pronounced temperature dependence or decrease of the uh, the stress to move dislocations in, uh, in ferritic steels. Okay, just let's um, just um, think a little bit about um, this, these dislocation velocities. Yeah? You probably don't think you can calculate dislocation velocities, but you can you know, um, 
we could just use the formula we just derived and say, well, let's just make a few uh, assumptions and see if we can calculate this location velocities. Yeah? Um, so so we'll, we'll just assume that we have a certain strain rate hmm? uh, and, and we have specific dislocation density. Yeah? So it, we should be able to calculate what dislocation velocities are. Hmm? For instance, we say this location velocity this density of 10 to the 13 per uh, square meter. That's, uh, you may not, you, you, some of you may be uh, familiar with dislocation density values, but that, that would be like a, a reasonable, reasonably low dislocation uh, density. And a strain rate, say 5.5, 5, 10 to the minus 5, that's a reasonable uh, strain rate you would have in a tensile test. That's a rather slow tensile test, yes. So, um, so what is my uh, shear strain rate in this case? Uh, well, this is a, this strain rate is a macroscopic strain rate. So if I want to translate it into a shear strain rate, I can always use my M value, right, to get that. Okay, so that's easy, that's the value about three. Okay, and I just apply this formula. I, uh, my uh, shear strain rate here, did I, do, I think I did this wrong. No, the shear strain rate is this. The um, uh, shear strain rate is M times the uh, uh, applied uh, shear uh, uh, strain rate, yes. And then I, I just use uh, this here the uh, uh, dislocation density, yeah, and this is the Burgers factor, yes, times the velocity of this. So what do I get? Uh, v is 6.7 times to the minus 8 centimeters per second, okay? That's the, the velocity of dislocation. So that means that if you want to get that kind of deformation, yeah, that's the kind of velocities your dislocation must have if we have this density. Hmm? Okay? All right. So, what do we, um, you can actually do measurements on dislocation velocities. And uh, as I said earlier, the dislocation uh, velocity is a function of the stress you apply, yes? and the mobility of the dislocation. So here, um, I illustrate the fact that um, when you do um, uh, experimental measurements, you can actually uh, see the stress dependence. Yes? And the stress dependent is very often um, uh, represented by this empirical function. So the velocity of the dislocation is equal to the, uh, it's proportional to tau to the power m. And in order to avoid complications with uh, units, it's, it's usually presented as the dislocation uh, velocity of the dislocation divided by a reference velocity is equal to tau over a reference uh, uh, shear stress to the power m. So uh, v, v0 or v0 is, the, um, uh, is a velocity of one centimeter per second, and tau0 is the shear stress required to achieve this uh, dislocation velocity. So, so people have done measurements, yes, measurements. Uh, for single crystals of alpha iron, for uh, iron 3% silicon, uh, measuring dislocation velocity as a function of the resolved shear stress. A, you have to be very, very patient to do this kind of measurements. And uh, they've done it for edge dislocation and screw dislocations as a function of the resolved shear stress. And these are some examples here. So at room temperature, hmm, you can see here, for instance, for single crystals, of iron, you get different value, a different uh, situation than for uh, iron 3% silicon. Um, you can see, for instance, that the tau zero is 
the stress for a velocity of one centimeter per second, right? So that would be around here. So you see that for single crystals, uh, you have a much lower value than for this, the silicon. Yes, and the reason is, of course, uh, solid solution hardening. And you also have a very different M value, uh, stress. This M value is called the stress exponent. Hmm? And uh, in particular, the uh, stress exponent is much higher for the, the, the high silicon uh, uh, situation. And we'll, this is empirical value, uh, uh, empirical uh, equation. We'll come back to this uh, stress exponent uh, later on. Hmm? But at this stage, it's important uh, for you to know that, that this equation exists, that you can write stress uh, is proportional to, excuse me, the uh, velocity, dislocation velocity is proportional to the shear stress to a power m. Okay? So that's, um, so the, the control now of the, the velocity. Hmm? So we, we already know that in alpha iron it's lattice resistance, in gamma iron it's forest dislocation. How does this look here? What, what do we mean with this lattice resistance? Well, when a dislocation in alpha iron moves, yes, um, the velocity of the dislocation is fully determined by the um, velocity or mobility, let's put it this way, mobility of the screw dislocation. And this screw dislocation hmm, moves in a process that's called the double kink uh, process, yeah? double kink nucleation and propagation. So what happens is I have a Piles Valley, another Piles Valley, hmm? so, the, uh, so that's a 111 direction, another 111 valley, yes, and the dislocation jumps locally, not the entire dislocation, but makes a little bulge and then this bulge jumps to the next valley. Hmm? And in the process, it creates two edge bits of dislocations. You can see because the Burgess factor is in this direction, right? So these are edge dislocations yeah, that cross this uh, Pyrrhal's barrier. Yes? yes, And these move sideways. And they move sideways very rapidly. So the reason is the following. If you look at the core of the screw dislocation here, yes, it's sessile. It has an extended core, yes. And the the bit that has moved to the the next Pyrrhus valley also has an extended core. It's also sessile. But the bit that crosses over the Pyrrhus hill here, yes, has a glissile core. It's it it's not extended in three dimensions, yes. And that's why this bit can move very f quickly laterally and achieve the motion of the dislocation. So let's look now at the process in more detail. So let's, you can refer to this drawing here, perhaps. Hmm? So first you form a little bulge, yes? yes? That happens by thermal activation. You have this location moves you know, uh, back and forth in the Pars Valley and then at uh, one moment has enough uh, thermal energy to cross this barrier. Yeah? And then you form a kink pair. Yes. Uh, so now the two kink pairs are small edge dislocations with opposite Burgess vector. So initially, when they're very close to each other, uh, they will be attractive. Yes? They will be attracted to each other. And that's balanced by the force on the dislocation which pulls them apart. Hmm? Uh, the activation energy for kink formation hmm, is for, for the formation of a kink is much higher than the energy for kink migration. So the energy for the kink to migrate here is, is much, much smaller. And the reason is the core structure is not uh, spread. Hmm? And so they will move uh, very fast once they are formed. 
The, so the rate of kink nucleation is very important in this whole process because that's the limiting, that's the factor that will be determining the velocity. Because once you have a kink, the two edges, they move very quickly. Next kink. So the limiting step is the kink formation. So nucleation rate of kink nucleation is low compared to kink velocity. The kink density, uh, of course, is also small on my dislocations. Hmm? And there will also be kink annihilation processes when, when two uh, kinks meet, of opposite sign meet. Hmm? And the kinks move to the end of the dislocation where they may be pinned, where they're usually pinned, and, and they, there they formed curved segments. Yeah? Okay, so let's, let's uh, draw this a little bit larger. So you, first step is I have dislocation bulges, then I form kinks, and two, excuse me, they, they form a, a new screw segment in the next Pyros Valley, and I have these two edge kinks, and these edge kinks have very high velocity, and they move laterally. Hmm? And when they've moved to the end, my dislocation has, has jumped from one uh, Pyros Valley to the next one, but not in one, sing in one single go, yes? So let's see how we can describe this, okay? So um, what, what happens in the, um, in the in, uh, during the uh, double kink process? You know, I have applied some stress on my material, pull the material, or I press, compress it. What, what happens? Well, first of all, I have um, an external force that works on my uh, uh, kink, yes? The uh, shear stress times B, so that's the peach curler formula, yeah? times X. X is the, the dimensions, the length of the, uh, the kink. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, I need to look at the uh, activation energy for kink formation. So at 0k, the kink formation energy is two times the formation energy for one kink, which is hk. Hmm? Then there is an attractive interaction between the two kink segments, yes, which has a certain form. And then there is an externally applied stress, which drives the kinks apart, yes. And so the equation for the activation energy looks like this. It's there is a term, kink formation at 0, k, okay? an interaction term between the two uh, kinks, yes? And then the effect of the stress, the externally applied stress on the kink. Okay. And so I can... Uh, to make a long story uh, a bit shorter than, um, uh, not to make a long story short, this is, this is the, the, um, uh, the way you have to look at it. So first of all, to make bulges, yes, you, to make bulges, you need activation energy, yes, which uh, is reduced by the applied shear stress. Okay? So it's easier to make a bulge if we reduce the, if, if, we, um, if we apply a shear stress. Yeah? And at, at zero K, yes, at zero K, uh, I need to apply the pyral stress, yes, to, uh, to make the dislocation move, okay? To this bulge formation. Kink pair formation activation energy is equal to, so I have three terms, right? I have the first term is the, uh, the kink formation energy at zero, okay? Then I have this term, which is the interaction term, which looks like this, yes, okay? And then we have the, um, um, 
the, the, the peach color effect, yes, so the stress on the, the kink part, which is minus tau times B times H times X. So um, this is energy, right? So the, I need to have the force is tau times B times the length of the dislocation, so is X times H. H is the distance uh, that we, uh, over which the dislocation is, is moving. So this is the equivalent of the, the energy uh, 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 done by the external force. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's say a few words about this interaction term. This interaction term is not that important, right? It's only important at the very first uh, moments where you've made a kink, when the two dislocations are interacting strongly, yes? And, and, and this is the interaction term. So at the beginning, so the, uh, this, the activation energy, as a function of the distance, this distance here, will, be, will have this shape. Yes? So we have dislocation bulge effect, then we have a stage where the, the, the two edges are very close to each other and there's, there's strong interaction there. But what we're interested in is the stage where we have independent kinks, the independent kink stage, yeah? okay? And that's where we, we have this effect, the effect of the applied stress. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see here that uh, in this case, uh, this term here, this interaction term, uh, doesn't work anymore when the, when the two edge dislocations are far away. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So we reach a maximum, yes, and then there is a decrease. Okay? And the idea is to a kink will spread, yes, once we reach this this critical uh, this this critical size, if you want, you know, this critical size. And you we can calculate this critical size because it's, we just make the derivative of the um, activation and every with distance, distance being the, the, the width, the width of the, the size of the kink, and we find this square root value here for Xc, and, this, and then the maximum activation energy is, is then this, okay? So once a dislocation, or a kink rather, achieves this critical energy, or this critical size, yes, the kinks will very quickly move apart, yes, rapidly. So that's, that's the point uh, that is of importance. So if we know this, yes, we can calculate the rate of kink pair formations, yes? The, the rate of kink pairs is, first of all, is the attempt frequency. How often per second does the dislocation attempt to, to swing from one Piles Valley to the next? Yeah. We usually set this equal to the Debye frequency. That's kind of the natural f uh, vibration frequency of my crystal. Yeah. Uh, then the length uh, times the, 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 uh, the length of the dislocation divided by the critical uh, length, so how many pieces are critical, can, can have, have the correct length, yes? And then multiplied with how many of the jumps are successful, yes? It's basically expressing that the thing is, the process is thermally activated, yeah? And, okay, and, and so in, in here, the activation energy is what we derived here, yeah? Okay. So, and, and you can see that at a certain temperature and for a certain uh, double kink formation energy, the higher the stress I apply, yes, the higher the, the, the number of successful attempts will be to form kinks, yes? Okay, so I can uh, recalculate this. This equation is based on a number of simplifications, yes? Uh, in particular, 
related to this attempt frequency. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you want to take into account the fact that uh, you shouldn't use the natural vibration frequency of the crystal, but you should use the vibration frequency of the dislocation itself, then the formula looks very slightly different. You add a term B over the critical width of the, the kink. So the dislocation velocity is then very simply the Burgess factor times the attempt frequency. Yes? Uh, sorry, the Burgess factor times the, the nucleation rate because the nucleation, t uh, the Burgess factor is the distance that you travel and the, uh, the nucleation rate tells you how often you travel that distance, yes, per second. So if you make this uh, product, you find the dislocation velocity. And so the dislocation velocity is a function of, uh, oops, yeah, you can see here, of the applied stress yes and the length of the dislocation and the temperature so what does it say the dislocation velocity goes up when the length of the dislocation goes up when the applied stress goes up yes and it also goes up uh, with stress because there is a reduction you can see here the minus sign a reduction of the activation energy as we apply stress. Hmm? Okay, so the uh, the dislocation velocity is, is controlled by the Pyle's mechanism, hmm? Hmm? Uh, and uh, so excuse me, the double kink formation mechanism. So it depend on the applied stress and the temperature and uh, the length of the dislocation. Uh, so longer dis why is that? Because longer dislocation moves faster because it has more nucleation sites for kinks. And uh, so this is what we found, okay? Tau, L, and then this factor here where you see that the activation energy is reduced by the application of a, uh, a, a shear stress. All right, so um, uh, the strain rate is maintained because uh, of dislocations which have the right velocity. Yeah? So, uh, so if we have a certain dislocation density, uh, uh, mobile dislocation density equal to re, uh, rho here, the rate is given by B times dislocation density times this dislocation velocity, which is stress dependent. Hmm? Hmm? So, an increase in strain rate yeah, at co for constant dislocation, let's say, you can only achieve this when you apply a higher stress. Yes? And what does this higher stress do? Yes? Mm -hmm. It increases the number of double kinks on the dislocations. Mm -hmm. It's related to double kink nucleation rate. Okay. And the nucleation rate of kinks is the controlling factor because the propagation of the kinks takes no time, no energy in comparison. So there's plenty of uh, thermal energy around to uh, uh, look, do this. Okay, so uh, let's, let's close now and uh, we'll meet on, uh, on Thursday morning Will we go to an example where we you know, calculate some values based on this, this theory? All right? So thank you for your attention. So, yeah, and I, uh, if it's a little bit theoretical, don't worry about it. That's what it is. It's. Uh, it's not an easy subject, uh, but I, I, I've tried to um, simplify things where, where possible. And we'll, as again, we'll go into the, uh, some more detail and, and show you that, um, that actually 
you can derive uh, equations uh, based on this approach, which, which are actually useful in practice. Okay. See you on Thursday.